Last video on Marx, right? Okay, so I mentioned to you the idea that one of the forces that will cause the collapse of capitalism is the secularly declining rate of profit. Sorry, the dog came in. Um, the fact that over time, rates of profit will decline, making businesses really close to bankruptcy, well, you know, barely making, uh, barely making it in the black uh, all the time, so that when there are economic downturns, they become more serious. He also thought they'd become more, more common up to the uh, collapse of capitalism. So, um, there's actually some controversy about this within Marxism. There were a couple of guys, it's outlined in the book, uh, Baron and Sweezy, and they said, well, actually, we looked at the numbers, and it looks like profits are going up. So, in their opinion, what was going to happen was that the rate of profit would go up, but that would cause a redistribution of income away from the workers, which would mean they couldn't buy goods and services, which would mean that ultimately the firms would fail anyway. But they thought that the rate of profit over time, time, rate of profit, And there's like Marx and I can't remember how to pronounce how to spell their names, but I think that's right. It's in the book. I don't think it's in my notes. Da, 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 da. Oh, no, it's not. All right, anyway, I think that's how you spell their names. All right. Um, remember I said that anomalies can accumulate when I was talking about the Kuhnian view of schools of thought of paradigms, and that as long as they aren't written off as outlier, minor outliers or errors in, in measurement. That's exactly what the guy who, who read this chapter for me says they're doing. He says they're doing an error in measurement. He says that the numbers they're looking at, oh, I'm way far away from the screen. That's unusual. I wonder how that happened. Let me zoom in a bit. Um, anyway, stop, stop. Okay. Uh, he's saying that what they're doing is they're making an error in measurement that what they are calling the rate of profit uh, is not actually what Marx is talking about. Um, and, interestingly, also going back to some things we talked about earlier, uh, he goes to Kleiman, the one who says this is a measurement error, goes not to, in this sort of range here, in this range in trying to make your argument, do I look at the real world and sort of collect data, or do I sit and say, that just doesn't make sense. He goes to this end. He says, look, we don't actually collect data in a way in the real world that would even allow us to test Marx's theory. But think about it for a minute. This is what Kleinman says. He says, think about it for a minute. It must be true that Marx is right because if we divide the same volume of labor by a larger and larger level of output, that necessarily reduces the rate of profit per unit. I got a little chart for that. Uh, so you get output, then value per unit. Uh, two more, exploitation and profit per unit. See if I was able to fit all that on the screen. I was, all right. Mm. Here is Andrew Kleiman's argument in favor of Marx's original view. Kleiman says, hey, let's say you've got your workers working for a thousand hours. You know, here's, here's time, um, uh, let's say 2020 and 2030, uh, when we've had an increase in technology of some sort and COVID-19 is gone. Um, 
So he says, uh, look at these numbers. All right, for the initial one, let's say that for a thousand hours, your workers created 100 units of output, which meant that each unit of output took 10 hours to make. How much value is embedded in those 100 units of output? Took you a thousand hours, must be about 10 hours of uh, value in each unit of output. All right, let me say it again. Your workers spent a thousand hours making a hundred things, so that this is the value that they imparted into that thing. Remember, labor is the thing that creates value. So there's 10 hours worth of labor in each one of those 100 things. Now, remember I told you earlier too that Marx figured that the rate of exploitation in society was about 50%. That if you at your job created 10 hours worth of value, the capitalist kept five and you got five, all right? So it was 50% rate of, of, uh, of uh, exploitation. That means then that we're getting five hours worth of profit as the entrepreneur. For every unit I sell, for every one of these I sell, I get five hours worth of, of profit, however, the, you know, whatever the value of that is in dollars, in dollar terms. Uh, and so, essentially, 500 uh, of, of this. So once again, your workers have spent a thousand hours making a hundred things, so therefore the, the uh, value embedded in each thing is 10 hours. If me as the capitalist, if I'm able to keep half of everything my workers create, then I'm keeping five hours per unit of output. For every unit of output I sell, I get five hours of the value and I give my workers five hours worth of value. Uh, again, whatever that turns out to be monetarily. Now, let's say, let me use a different color here. Let's say that 10 years later, productivity has increased, just as we have already said that Marx argues is true. For the same amount of work at the factory, your workers are making 200 units and not 100. So the amount of value per unit, per unit is now just five hours, because it only took five hours to make it. Right? Uh, and so if we maintain the same rate of exploitation, my profit per unit has gone down. It's inevitable. If we continue to produce more and more and more out of the same number of hours, profit per unit has to fall. And think about it. If the only source of value is labor, all right, if we're assuming the only source of value is labor, and labor can make more and more things, then the amount of, of labor value per thing is going to fall. And therefore, at the same rate of exploitation, my profits are going to fall. Per unit, my profits are going to fall. For every laptop I sell, the easier it is to make these laptops, the less profit I make per laptop. Right? Uh, and so that's what he's saying. Mark, uh, uh, Clymer is saying, this is what Marx is arguing. And it's inevitable. It's simply logical from an, intu from an intuitive standpoint. If you sit and think about these uh, you know, various factors, like, well, um, how could one argue that it would not be 10 hours per uh, unit in value if it took him 1,000 hours to make 100 things? And obviously, if we change the numbers here, it doesn't change the story at all. But Kleiman is saying, if this is the story, I don't care what frickin' numbers you put in, this keeps getting smaller. Now, he said there may be offsetting factors as time goes on. Perhaps the, the rate of exploitation changes or whatever. But ultimately, this increasing technology, this increasing productivity, is driving down the rate of profit. When the, rate of, when the rate of productivity doubled, the rate of profit halved. Now, maybe in the short run, your firm was the first one to come up with the labor-saving technique, and maybe you got some extra profit in the short run as you took market away from your competitors. But eventually, once everybody catches up, now we're all screwed. And then once everybody's got a, uh, a self-checkout lanes at the store, now it's not really an advantage anymore, and we're unable to exploit the machines in the same way that we're able to exploit the workers. And that's about it. Let me have a glance through here and see what else I had uh, in my notes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, there was something that's important in the, in the chapter. 
Uh, Marx thought that capitalism did serious psychological damage to the worker called alienation. People should, he believed, have the power to control their own destinies in what respect? They should be free to choose what they want to produce, determine what, how, uh, how that product will be used, cooperate with rather than compete with their fellow workers, and decide what skills they'd like to develop. So that's his ultimate goal, is to allow people, to allow you to major in whatever you want to major in, uh, regardless of whether or not you can get a job in it, because you enjoy it and because it's going to make you feel like a um, more complete human being. And you can figure that out, you can figure that out. Uh, mm -hmm, that's a good one. Let's see. Uh, then we get the stuff on Lenin and Mao. That's kind of interesting. Be sure to read through that. I, I mentioned to you earlier that there are ways to, and I think I'll, I'll close off on this, there are ways to explain capitalist exploitation without the labor theory of value. I already told you one, and that was that just the sheer inequity of when me as a worker, in order to earn... Yeah. Me as a worker, the way I earn income is to expend labor power. For a capitalist, the way I earn income is to own the means of production. All right, own the means of production. I've got to go to the factory to take advantage of the of the means I have of earning income. I got to go and I got to clock in and I got to be there for eight hours and then I go home afterwards. Right? Um, they can do this from the Caribbean. Owning you can do from anywhere. You don't have to expend time. So, so uh, I've read a Marxist argument that says this is the source of the inequity right here. Um, perhaps society gets a benefit from this. But even if that's true, we have to ask the question, is the actual benefit they're getting out of line with what it should be in terms of the social uh, benefit? Another argument you could make uh, as a Marxist with, with not, uh, w without using labor theory of value would involve John Rawls, a famous philosopher who talked about justice. All right? uh, and Rawlsian justice is when a system is set up in a way that you don't care which role you play. It doesn't matter which person you are. Right? You, uh, you put together a, a, a game and the situation is such that, gosh, I don't know if I want to be that player or that player. It doesn't really make much difference. The, 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 uh, in my sense, the, the odds are the same. And um, here's an example. It's Thanksgiving, there's one piece of pie left. You and your sibling both want that piece of pie. So one of your parents, the wise one, says, uh, Child A, because you haven't decided on a name yet, Child A, you slice the pie, but Child B gets to choose which slice. Now think about that. Child A is like, crap, I don't know which role I'm going to play. Uh, so what is Child A going to do? try their absolute hardest to cut it right down the middle so that uh, it doesn't matter what the next kid chooses. So when you don't know which role you're going to play, then you design a system that is the most fair because you don't know, you know, in our own society, do I want to be white or black, a woman, uh, a man, um, a transgender, whatever. Uh, there are some reasons to believe that, the, that, that in our own society, if you got to pick, then there are some that you prefer over others in terms of how you would be treated and the opportunities that you have, right? So that means it's not fair. So here, with a very simple example, uh, you have the person design the system without knowing which role they're going to play because you want people to be indifferent to the role they're going to play. That's a fair system if you're indifferent, okay? Are you indifferent between those two roles? Well, like, I don't care if I'm a worker or a capitalist. Uh, it, it, you know, either one gives me plenty of opportunities. Most people are going to say, yeah, I'd rather be the capitalist. Okay, so it's not fair.
Right. Now, again, we can ask the question, does society get some benefit out of the inequities that exist? In, in, which, in, you know, in which case, then, I mean, for example, uh, physicians, doctors are often paid more than um, other people in society. You say, well, yeah, but, I mean, we get a benefit from that. We attract the best and the brightest to something that keeps us alive. So, you know, you can ask the question, is it justified under some other basis? But essentially, we aren't indifferent. All right, that, that we would all rather be capitalists than workers. And the last one I put in the book was just like, and look, if we've got a system wherein one group of people owns the means to keep you, oops, I combined the A and the L, alive. That's kind of scary. If one group of people owns a means of production, then um, that in and of itself can make you think, this is kind of a scary system. Uh, that uh, if, if the capitalists own the means of production, then I have no choice but to work for the capitalist. I have to submit to the will of the capitalist. Uh, again, all right, and so, so you know, it's sort of in summary here, that was it, but sort of in summary here, um, don't forget, though, that he's saying that capitalism does some wonderful things, uh, that capitalism is absolutely necessary to our advance in the next economic system, which is going to be socialism and eventually uh, communism, of course. And, and so he, he's not uh, he absolutely believes there's evils in capitalism, you know, from looking at Tiny Tim and Bob Cratchit and so forth, uh, but uh, probably not in the way that you thought before you heard about how Marx worked, uh, and especially in terms of what his ultimate goal is, and that is to make sure that people can live their life that you can major in whatever you want to major in. And that's it for Marxism.